Now let's take a look at some of the factors influencing drying. There is more to drying than simply placing slices of a material on a rack and blowing hot air across them. We will now examine some of the factors which influence the drying process. We have already introduced this concept of size or thickness in a previous discussion. However, it is something that should be confirmed with experimental data. The thicker the slices of apples in this test, the slower they dried. Here we see a graph where we're plotting the weight of the apple slices against time. We have three different thicknesses starting with 0.8 centimeters thick, which is 8 millimeters, 0.6 centimeters thick, which is 6 millimeters or a quarter of an inch, and 0.4 centimeters or 4 millimeters thick. You can see a horizontal dashed line has been drawn across the graph about one-third of the way up the vertical axis. So what we're looking for then is the time taken for the apple slices to reach the weight indicated by the horizontal dashed line. We will drop a perpendicular down from the point where the 0.4 centimeter thick line crossed that dashed line and this will be indicated by T1 on the horizontal time axis. The time taken for the 0.6 centimeter thick apple slices to reach this weight is indicated by T2 and the time taken for the 0.8 centimeter thick apple slices to reach this weight is indicated by T3. So from the graph it is quite obvious that it took longer for the 0.8 centimeter thick apple slices to reach this designated weight than it did for the other two thicknesses. So the thinner the slices, the faster they dry. About five to six millimeters or a quarter of an inch is really a good thickness to use for many fruits and vegetables. It's easy to visualize when cutting and it's an easy thickness to handle. Drying times are also reasonable with this thickness. Now let's take a look at another important variable. That's air temperature. So as the temperature of the air increases, the rate of water removal increases as well. But we have to be careful here. And in these tests, we're going to use a uniform air velocity of 0.5 meters per second. Here's the graph. I've only used two temperatures here. One is 50 degrees Celsius, and the other one is 60 degrees Celsius. And on the horizontal axis we have time, while on the vertical axis we have the weight of the material that we're drying, which in this case is pepper slices. So we start off with a uniform weight of pepper slices, and as you see, the weight falls faster with the 60 degree Celsius temperature than it did with the 50 degree Celsius air temperature. And we can see that by the times which are taken for the weight of the pepper slices to reach that horizontal dashed line. T1 is the time taken for the pepper slices to reach that weight at 60 degrees and it is a shorter time than is taken for the peppers to reach that weight when they're dried with an air temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. Now as the speed of the air increases the rate of water removal tends to increase as well until a maximum rate of water removal is reached. Here we see another experiment done with peppers. The weight of the pepper slices is on the vertical axis, time is on the horizontal axis, and we have two different air velocities here. The slower rate of 0.25 meters per second dries the pepper slices more slowly than the air velocity of 0.5 meters per second. And in this series of tests, I did air velocities of 0.75 meters per second and 1.0 meters per second as well. And they showed very little improvement over the 0.5 meter per second air velocity. But the difference here between the 0.25 
and 0 0.50 meter per second air velocity is quite pronounced. Now let's take a look at how moisture removal actually takes place. During the early stages of drying, moisture removal takes place from a pool of moisture on the saturated surface of the material. Here we see this represented diagrammatically. So warm dry air is blowing across the surface of the material and we're looking at it from the side of this slice of material and we have the center line indicated by that dashed line and moisture is traveling from the center line outwards to the surface and we have this moisture forming a saturated pool on the surface and as the air blows across it evaporates moisture rapidly from the saturated surface and we have moist air leaving the dryer. The same thing will happen on the bottom surface as well if you have an open wire mesh rack in your dryer. As long as there is sufficient moisture at the surface of the material to keep it saturated, the rate of water removal will stay constant. When the surface is no longer saturated, diffusion of moisture from inside the material begins to control the rate of drying. The rate will decrease as more and more moisture is removed. So here we see what happens now when the saturated surface is missing. There is no moisture pool on the surface. So now as the moisture diffuses slowly from the center of the product to the surface, it is removed. So the warm dry air picks up this moisture and it leaves as warm air but it contains less moisture than is in the case of when we had that saturated pool of moisture on the surface. You need to understand when the drying mechanism changes from removal on the surface to diffusion being the controlling factor. This is the critical moisture content. And here we see the typical stages of drying. From point A to point B, we have what's called a warm-up period where there's no appreciable loss of moisture. And you may not see this in every test that you drew or every run that you do in your dryer. In fact, I very seldom see this in the drying runs that I do. It's very common when you have a cold material that has a lot of moisture in it. But in the case of room temperature product being put into the dryer, moisture loss it begins to occur even as you're loading the dryer. Then we go from point B down to point C, which we call the constant rate drying period. This is when you have that saturated surface on the product, which has a pool of moisture, which is being evaporated by the warm dry air coming into the dryer and it's being evaporated at a constant rate. So if you were to lay a ruler along this diagram, you would find that the line from B to C is relatively straight. At point C, we then enter into what we call the falling rate drying period. Point C would represent the critical moisture content where this transition takes place. And after this, we no longer have a pool of moisture on the saturated surface of the product and diffusion of moisture from the inside of the material begins to control the rate of water removal. So as more and more moisture is removed, the rate of moisture removal becomes slower and slower. And finally, at point D, you see that the rate is incredibly slow and that the curve is getting to be very close to a horizontal line indicating that no more moisture is being removed. Many drying processes do not have a warm-up period as I said. The constant rate drying period may be quite short in some drying processes. It could be only 30 minutes long or it could be an hour and a half two hours or even three hours long, but don't expect it to be much longer than that. You cannot rush the diffusion process in the falling rate drying period, and this is where a lot of people make a big mistake. They try to rush the removal of moisture.
we have a stagnant boundary layer that we need to consider as well. When there is insufficient air circulation, a situation may arise where moisture evaporating from the surface of the material causes the adjoining air to become saturated with water vapor. If this happens, water removal will cease or become extremely slow. This is the development of a stagnant boundary layer and must be avoided for proper drying to take place. And I want you to take a look at the following diagram. But before we do that, just as an aside, we wear sweaters to keep a stagnant boundary layer of air against our bodies when we want to stay warm. But we use a fan to blow across our bare arms to remove the stagnant boundary layer of air when we want to cool down. So wearing a sweater like this will keep a stagnant boundary layer of air against our body that is hard for any of the air around us to remove. So here's the diagram to which I was referring for the stagnant boundary layer. Here we see the moisture at the saturated surface forming a pool of water and that pool of water is evaporating into the air just above it. And this air can become saturated and it's not moving away. So what we need to do then is recognize that the stagnant boundary layer of air is saturated and cannot absorb any more moisture so evaporation will slow down or cease to take place at all. To eliminate the stagnant boundary layer it's necessary to increase the velocity of the air in the dryer. This sweeps away the moist air from the surface of the material and replaces it with fresh dry air which will promote evaporation from the surface of the material we are trying to dry. So air velocity has an important role in dryer operations and it is often overlooked. 0.5 meters per second works well in most of the drying tests that I have done. And I want you to beware of excessive temperatures. The mistake that a lot of people make is assuming that if 50 degrees Celsius is good for drying, then 80 degrees Celsius must be a lot better. This is a totally erroneous assumption that can lead to some serious problems. And the serious problem is called case hardening. In normal drying, there is a continuous removal of water at or near the surface of the material. And here we have a diagram showing you what has happened. We haven't shown a layer of saturation at the surface where we had the pool of moisture in the constant rate drying period, but you can see what is happening. The air flowing across the surface is evaporating the moisture and we have a good drying situation. But excessively high temperatures can remove the surface moisture quite quickly. And this dries out the surface before moisture from inside the material can diffuse outwards to that surface. The result is the formation of a dry or often leathery layer around the material. This layer then acts as a barrier to further moisture removal. And diagrammatically, we can represent that by showing this rather dry outer layer or leathery layer as a grayish boundary around the slice that's being dried. So we've got moisture trapped inside the shrunken pepper slice in this case with little moisture leaving the slices. And we've got very hot air moving across the surface which has dried it out and this has created a situation called case hardening. After a while the material will feel dry to the touch and it will have a leathery texture that makes it seem like the drying is complete. However, with time the moisture trapped inside the material will indeed find its way to the surface of the leathery layer and this is what's happening when we place the material into the package and store it on a shelf for a given period of time. And the end result is often mold growth. You cannot rush the diffusion of moisture in a drying process. Do not fall victim to the temptation to use high temperatures to speed up a drying process. You must maintain a suitable air temperature
and have sufficient air velocity to dry things properly. I need to emphasize that. So here we see that we're drying these apple slices at 52 degrees Celsius and we have an air velocity as indicated by this device as being 0 0.48 meters per second which is very close to the target that I have of 0 0.50 meters per second. So be very very aware of this in any of the drying work that you do. Thank you very much.